Hare Krishna. So today morning we continue our discussion on the Srimad Bhagavatam, the prayers offered by Shri Lord Maharaj to Narasimhadev. And this prayer, he says, Swastya Swastya that let there be auspiciousness for all the universe. And let the envious people be pacified. So the Lord is describing the Bhagavad Gita as Surdam Sarva Bhutana. In 5.29, it is said that he is the well wisher of all living beings. And later in 12.30, the Gurita Krishna says that Advesta Sarva Bhutana Maitra Karuna Hecha. That those who are the devotees of the Lord, they become like him. They also become the well wishers of everyone. They also want the good for everyone. Sarva Bhutana Maitraha. They become the friends of everyone. So, we are discussing the theme of how Krishna is the ultimate healer. He is the supreme therapist. And yesterday, I talked about how God has been recast in mainstream religion from the cosmic supplier to the cosmic therapist. And this corresponds with people's primary distress in today's world being the distress at the mental level. Now, what causes distress at the mental level? It is the impurities in the heart. And what are the impurities in the heart? Uh, we could say, now, first of all, what exactly is the heart? Sometimes people say, oh, you broke my heart. Well, if you take an X-ray, you won't find any break in the heart. Isn't it? So, when we talk about the word heart, uh, we don't use it in literal terms. It doesn't refer to the biological organ heart. Heart refers primarily to the seat of emotions. And our capacity for emotions comes from the soul. But almost all our present emotions come from the mind. They are triggered by the mind. If somebody is very attached to this ball. And they experience intense emotions when their favorite team wins and they experience agony when their team loses. Now this emotion associated with baseball, they've got nothing to do with the soul. Still the, the person is experiencing it. So the soul, or if the soul were not present, there would be no emotions being experienced. The soul is the source of our capacity for emotions. But currently, most of our emotions come from the mind. That means, like this, uh, yesterday I was giving the example of a person watching a horror movie, a child watching a horror movie. The child may be safe at home, but because the consciousness is caught in the TV screen where the horror movie is going on, all the emotions are experienced in relationship to that, uh, in, with the images and the narrative on the screen. So we could say the soul is like the child, the TV screen is like the mind. In 30.22 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that the soul becomes situated in material nature because of the desire to enjoy worldly things. And that desire causes the soul to go through various experiences of good and bad in this life and future lives in various species. So basically, for us, ultimately the heart is meant to coincide with the soul. But presently the heart coincides with the mind. That means, if you say heart is the seat of emotions, most of the emotions that we experience right now are based on the impressions present in the mind. They are not based on the innate nature of the soul. So we could say that the soul we exist primarily in a distorted condition. In physics, there are two concepts. There's the center of mass and the center of gravity. So the center of mass is where the mass of the object is concentrated. But if the object is tilted, then its center of gravity will be somewhat different. Because its mass gets unevenly distributed. And then accordingly, with respect to gravity, so the center of gravity shifts. So the Earth is not vertical, it is horizontal. Slightly tilted. 
and that's why its center of mass is center of gravity are different. So similarly, we can say for us as souls, the center of mass is the soul, but the center of gravity, where we experience the pull of desires, that is different. So the center of gravity is where the mind is situated. The center of mass is where the soul is, and depending on how inclined we are, to that extent, there's a distance between the mind and the soul. So a person in the mode of ignorance experiences no emotions when they come to a temple, but when they go to a bar, they experience immense emotions. So a person in goodness experiences some emotions when they come to a temple. A pure devotee experiences the highest emotions when they come to a temple. Why? Because there is, for a pure devotee, there is a seat of emotions. The mind has become as the same as the soul. Moraman Vrindavan, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, my mind is the same as Vrindavan. It's Krishna residing over there, Krishna delighting over there, and the devotee delighting in the remembrance of Krishna. So basically, for us, the mind is where the impressions are stored, which trigger our emotions. Somebody has never watched a baseball match. For them, there are no emotions, there are no impressions about baseball stored in their mind. So they experience no emotions associated with it when they watch a baseball match. But somebody who has been hooked to baseball for many, many years, when they watch a baseball match, so many emotions coming because the impressions are stored in the mind. So basically, all the all that we experience in the, in the condition stage, almost all of it is based on the impressions stored in the mind. And to the extent these impressions are negative to that extent we experience distress. And from the soul's perspective, anything disconnected to Krishna is ultimately negative. It's the artham na pitta na pratiyeta chadmani atvidyana atmano maya yathavasu yathadamaha. But just as just Bhagavatam says, Maya means to see anything disconnected from Krishna. So to the extent our 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 center, we could say, our mind is distanced from the soul. That means our emotions are caught in more and more worldly things. To that extent, we are prone to agitation. Two people may be going in the same train. One is in goodness, one is in passion. The person in passion, the simple, the same act of entering into the train, catching the train, finding a seat in the train, that will cause much more anxiety and agitation to a person in the mode of passion than it will cause to a person in the mode of goodness. The same event of catching a train that may cause feeling of helplessness and self pity for a person in the mode of ignorance. Say, oh, how will I catch this train? There's too much crowd. If I don't reach in time, oh, this happens, that happens. So basically, the emotions that we experience are shaped by the mood that we are in. And that means that for us, when we are trying to connect with Krishna ourselves and we are trying to connect others with Krishna, at that time, we want to shift the center of their emotions from something in this world to Krishna. We want the center to shift from the mind to the heart, from the, from the mind to the soul. And for this to happen, <coughs> they need to have some level, they need to be peaceful. If, if we are too agitated, we can't practice anything sustainably. Bhakti can be begun in any mood. A person who is a drunkard can see the devotee dancing in Kirtan and join me join in the Kirtan. And they may also smile and laugh and they may experience something spiritual. But for them to take that special experience as an impetus to start the steady practice of Bhakti, that requires some goodness. In general, sustainability is a feature of goodness. So, Vishnu maintains. Similarly, for us to sustain ourselves in bhakti, we need some amount of goodness.
this. And so does anybody who is coming to Krishna's lotus feet. So as devotees, when we understand that in today's world, the main distress that people experience is psychological. Of course, there is physical distress also immensely in many parts of the world. In many parts of the third world, there are people who are starving, there are people who are living in materially deprived conditions. But along with that, in the major part of the world, even major part of the developed world, people are in immense distress at the psychological level. And we need to attract them to Krishna. And bhakti is a voluntary activity. Turning towards Krishna is an act of free will that each soul has to choose. So it is for us to act in such a way that people feel inspired to use their free will to come towards Krishna. Suppose there's a person who is wildly drunk and they have got a million dollar check in their hands. Now, whoever comes and speaks some sweet words to them, they might just give that million dollar check to that person. Now, somebody might come and just use the abuse their money for their selfish purposes. Somebody else may come and just steal the money away from them and leave the person with nothing. But if somebody is that person's well-wisher, they want that this person should use this million dollars carefully. And right now, they don't know how to use the million dollars. So then, this person in the drunk state has to be persuaded. The sober person, the sober well-wisher, will have to come to the drunk person and speak in such a way that that person becomes willing to hand over that million dollars to the well -wisher. And the well can use that million dollars properly or guide that person how to use it properly. So similarly, we can see that each soul is like a drunk person. People are materially drunk, intoxicated by their worldly infatuation. Nunam pramatta kurute karma. The teachings of Rusha Bhavi just said that we are all intoxicated in this world. And the million dollar check that we all have is our free will. We all have some free will. And by that free will, we can do a lot of good and we can do a lot of harm. So this free will is extremely precious. It defines it, it, the use of how we use the free will is going to define not only our future, but also the future of many others connected with us. So when we as devotees interact with others on behalf of Krishna, we have to understand that somehow or the other, we have to give them the faith by which they will entrust their free will to us. So the free will is not like a physical check which will be taken from one person given to another. But the free will can be entrusted in the sense that they can take the guidance of someone else about how to use their free will. And the mood of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is not domineering. It is inviting. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells in 18.63, and do as you desire. So Krishna is acknowledging the free will of Arjuna. At the same time, he is appealing to the intelligence. So Arjuna, deliberate and then use your free will properly. Nowhere in the Bhagavad Gita does Krishna rely on his Godhood to demand obedience from Arjuna. You say, I am God. If you don't obey me, I will send you to hell. Therefore, obey me. No, nothing like that. Krishna is persuading, explaining, reasoning, and then eventually concludes by appealing to Arjuna. Do as you desire. Please deliberate. And at the end, 10 verses later, in 80.73, what does the success of Krishna's strategy see when Arjuna surrenders? He says, I will do your will. I will do your will. So that free will which each soul has, that 
is it's as i said it's a very precious asset but it is not like a transferable check it is not something which i have and i can give to someone else it is a free will which is the free will is our possession always and on a moment to moment basis it has to be handed over it has to be used wisely the super soul is right next to us in our hearts at each moment and he is guiding us prompting us of course if we are too much covered by the lower modes then we don't even hear his voice but he so the free will is something which you have to use at each moment now sometimes the free will may appear to be hey, it's not like a million dollars but it is something trivial whether i go here i go there whether i read this email or watch this tv or watch the first this movie watch this video or do this it seems all seems trivial but actually even people who are earn a million dollars or a billion dollars for that matter they earn it because they use their free will properly properly in terms of working investing to earn that money so the moment the moment to moment use of free will is in the long term enormously consequential there are some times which are defining in our life if somebody decides okay i'm going i'm going to take go in this career or that career am i going to marry this person or that person am i going to uh, say take a spiritual path am i going to join this path or that path am i going to take teaching from this spiritual master to that spiritual master those movements are especially defining at that time we understand a lot of is at stake but how we act in those movements is not just a matter of that we can decide at that time that is at a subconscious level shaped by how we have acted throughout our life because the way we act throughout our life shapes the mode that we are in and that mode shapes the decisions we make so that's why every moment is consequential and at every moment we need to inspire each other uh, to use the free will rightly to come towards krishna and first of all we have to use our free will rightly to move towards krishna so the free will is very highly influenceable by emotions all of us have two sides we have an emotional side and a rational side we could broadly correlate the emotional side correlates with the mind and the rational side correlates with the intelligence so <clears throat> most of us we tend to be very emotional although we may think that i am rational we pride ourselves on our objectivity our rationality our calm thinking but still our emotions exert an enormous amount of force on us and especially in today's world which is what is called the post modern world in the post modern world the the idea of objective morality has largely been rejected so uh, in the in this world people think that if anybody says this is right and this is wrong you know all moral structures are simply covered power structures that is the idea of post modern people i mean when you say that this is right and this is wrong this is simply your way of giving power over me and making me do what you want me to do so this is the, and unfortunately many systems of morality have been misused like that religious morality has been used like that ideological morality has been used like that misused like that so basically there is a strong aversion to any normative idea this is right and this is wrong so therefore what what is it that people will act on in such a situation it is largely based on feelings based on what what makes me feel good that is what i lack according to in general if we consider we uh, we make our decisions based on four broad factors what are they tradition culture logic and mood tradition means this is what we have always done why do you why do you want to uh, church on sunday why do you go to temple on holy days that's what our ancestors always did so you always done this so we we'll do it one is tradition 
Second is culture. Why do you do it? Because everybody is doing it. Hey, why did you buy this phone? Hey, all my friends have got this phone. That's why I bought it. So culture means, tradition means what has been done in the past. Culture is first to what is being done now. Then logic is, it makes sense to me. And I thought about it, it made sense. And that's why I did it. So we logically analyze and take some decisions. And fourth is mood. Why did you do it? I felt like doing it. You know, why are you reading this book? I just felt it must be a good book. I felt like book. I like the cover, so I'm reading it. So if you see broadly, these four factors determine the way we behave. Now, tradition in many ways is reviled in today's world. The culture itself today it is there. It is a very feel-good kind of culture. The culture actually uh, is basically an expression of our mood. Whatever people feel like doing, they do. And this process logic often goes for a toss. Logic just gets cast away. People do whatever they feel like doing. And when many people start doing that, then everybody like, this, this becomes the culture. And everybody starts doing that. So the point which I'm making is we are all very feeling driven. So our free will, we tend to use it based on our feelings. We are meant to use our logic. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita appeals both. Uh, appeals actually to all four of these. He talks about that this same knowledge being given in the past. Evam jnatma kritam karma purvai rapi mokshvi. Guru karmai matasmatam purvai purvataram kritam. And this way people have acted in the past and they have become liberated. So it's 4.15. Therefore, you should also act in this way and you will also become liberated. So, he says that this is the tradition. Then he also talks about culture. He says that that actually in the present world also, we, we all are not just the receivers of culture, we are also shapers of the culture. As all great people act, so people will act, common people will act accordingly. Srila Prabhupada, when he met George Harrison, he quoted this verse. Now we may say, he was just a musician. He, how is he a great person? Well, he greatness can be measured in different ways. And if a particular culture considers someone to be very famous, very 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 popular, then in that sense they are great. So the movie stars, the sports stars, the media icons, the way they act, that soon becomes a culture. So Krishna appeals to culture. So Arjuna, you are meant to culture shaper, act an exemplary. And as a Krishna appeals to the intelligence, reason. Just deliberate deeply and decide how you want to act. But along with that, he also appeals to the heart. He, this is the appeal to the head which he makes in 18.63. Krishna doesn't stop with that. In 18.64 and 65, you 18.63 is deliberate and decide. But 64 and 65, he appeals to the heart. He says that Sarva Guhyatamam Bhuya Shunume Paramam Vachaha Ishto Sime Durdamiti Tato Bhakshamite Hitam Sarva Guhyatamam Bhuya Oh, the most confidential knowledge I have given to you once again. Shunume Paramam Vachaha is a supreme knowledge. And why I have given it to you? Ishto Sime Durdamiti You are very dear to me. You are dearly loved by me. One natural way to translate this as I am determined to love you. Dudamiti. Ishto sime dudamiti. Tatovakshamite hitam. Therefore, for your well being, I am speaking this. So Krishna is bearing his heart, revealing that his heart is filled with loving concern for Arjuna. And Arjuna represents every man. He represents all of us. So Krishna is appealing to the heart. So the mood also shapes our decisions. And in this way, we see Krishna appeals to all four of these. When he uses all four of these, when he's trying to persuade Arjuna to make the right decision. Similarly, for us, when we get agitated and we turn towards Krishna, or when we approach people who in general we can assume are agitated. No matter how 
peaceful, how wise people look. Internally, everybody is in a state of agitation. I was in Australia, I was doing a, <coughs> I was doing a program and I was speaking about uh, gratitude and grace, how these can help us to cultivate positivity. And I was speaking and then there was a lady, she was, uh, she, uh, she was, she recorded some of my work after that and we were having some reflections and discussion. She spoke some very beautiful points about gratitude. And all of us were very impressed by it. But then after that, she came to talk with me privately. And just within one minute of talking, she started crying. She said, I'm trying to cultivate all this, but recently I lost my son. And I know all this, but it doesn't tell my good of light. So it was a dramatic realization for me. She was talking as if she was like, the way she was speaking was like a very wise sage, speaking very deep points about gratitude. But scrape a little below the surface, and there's so much distress over there. Of course, it is appreciated that even amidst the distress, she was trying to find some wisdom and shelter in her the wisdom. But then we need not just intellectual knowledge and wisdom, we need spiritual strength also. We need a way to connect ourselves spiritually with higher reality. And that often is not available for most people. So even if they mouth high sounding wisdom, unless they have a process for raising their consciousness, that wisdom they can't apply it in their lives. So actually everybody is agitated in the world. They may sometimes be peaceful, but below it, they are agitated. And how can we know that they are agitated? Because simply the world fills us with so many desires. And Krishna says three forces drive the mind mad. Raga, Bhaya and Krodha. Raga is attachment. I want this, I want this, I want this. The more things we want, that makes our mind agitated. And then when we want something, if somehow we get it also, then there is Bhaya. What if I lose it? What if I lose it? There is fear, fear. So getting something which is out there, that causes agitation of the mind. And then losing it or the fear of losing it, that causes, that causes another agitation of the mind. And then eventually when we lose it, there is frustration, there is anger. And that is another agitation of the mind. So everybody in the world is agitated. Because we all have desires and the culture that we live in tends to keep increasing our desires by exposing us to so many agitating stimuli. So amid the situation, people are very emotionally vulnerable. That means, emotionally vulnerable means whatever makes them feel good, that they will do. And whatever makes them feel bad, they will avoid it. Because there's so much distress at the internal level that anything that makes them feel bad, they're already having so many bad feelings, I just don't want anything more. So, for us, it, we want to give a spiritual message about bhakti, uh, but we have to make, we have to be aware of people's feelings, people's sensitivities, because people are very emotion driven. We may logically explain what your, your conception is wrong, and tomorrow I'll speak about you know, uh, effective, effectively communicating Krishna's message. Sometimes if we speak too strong, we may think my intention is to enlighten this person. But people feel bad by a strong speech and they're simply driven by their feelings. They just go away. So what we have to do is somehow or the other recognize that their feelings are driving them. They're very emotionally vulnerable. And just like a person who's drunk, they may just give the million dollars to anyone. Million dollar check to anyone. So like that, people, they're emotionally very vulnerable. Anybody who makes them feel good they will go in that direction. So Gladh Maharaj is praying over here, let there be auspiciousness on everyone. Let it, and how will that auspiciousness come? That is when they become devoted, when they become connected with Krishna, when they become free from the negativity in their hearts. So ultimately, Raga Bhaya Krodha, this uh, desire, anger, and fear, all these three, they arise fundamentally from our disconnection with Krishna. 
from our wanting to take the position of Krishna. In that sense, Prabhupada says that everybody in the world is envious. Almost everybody. So labeling people as envious and dismissing them is unhelpful. Because then we will not be able to have anyone to connect with. So within the emotionally vulnerable situation that people are in, somehow or the other, we have to inspire them to serve Krishna. We have to get them to connect with Krishna. Mr. Prabhupada was expert in this. Uh, I'll conclude with this that you know, he knew how to take people's emotional sensitivities and bring Krishna into that. Now, when Hippie came to Prabhupada and he asked him, What is the bliss of the spiritual world like? And Prabhupada said, It is like an ocean of LSD. Ocean of LSD. Now, somebody who might be a strict literary kind of uh, literal, trans literal conveyor of scriptural messages, in which scripture is it said that by Prabhupada's joy is like the LSD? LSD is a drug, it is tamasic, it is ignorance. And Krishna is transcendent, the supreme transcendence. But for a person whose only conception of happiness is, primary conception of happiness is, the high that they get of taking drugs, then what do you do? You have to convey it in their language. The point is not just to get it right. The point is to get it across. We may get it right, but if it alienates people, if it is incomprehensible to people, what have we achieved? The point is to get it across. So if people are very emotionally vulnerable, we were people emotionally hypersensitive, then within that, how do we give that message of Krishna to them? That is our challenge. And if we can, Prabhupada was able to take up this challenge and he was able to bring Krishna into the hearts of people who were far, far away from Krishna. Similarly, by his blessings, we too can try to do the same thing. How to do that? We will discuss in our future classes. So today, uh, so I'll summarize. I spoke today about how the devotee is godly in the sense that God is the well-wisher of all living beings and the devotee also wants to be the well-wisher of everyone. And being a well-wisher means that we have to get people to use their free will wisely. Then we all, as people not just out there, we all are like drunkards who have got a million dollar check. And anybody who makes us feel good, we might give that check. So for us, we, the million dollar check is like our free will. Certain moments in our life may seem to be like million dollar moments. They are defined, life defining moments. But every moment actually shapes how we act in those life defining moments. That's why every moment we have to be inspired to use our free will properly. And we have to inspire others to use their free will properly. So, people today in this postmodern world are very emotionally driven because they've rejected any normative things, any morality, as just any moral structures. Or simply, they say power structures to dominate over others by imposing one's own sense of right or wrong. So, in general, people act based on four factors tradition, culture, logic, and mood. So in today's world, tradition is mostly rejected. Culture is largely a reflection of what people's moods are. Culture simply stimulates that mood. And although we have a rational side, uh, which, which we sometimes use, but the emotional side influences us much, much more forcefully. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita uses all these four. He appeals to tradition, saying many people pass it on it. He appeals to culture, saying you are Arjuna meant to be a culture shaper. So back in the exemplary way, he appeals to reason, deliberate deeply and decide. And then he appeals to the heart. So I love you, I care for you, I want the best for you. That's why I'm speaking this. Please hear this. So similarly for us, when either we are trying to practice bhakti or we are trying to share bhakti with others, knowing that people are very emotionally vulnerable, knowing their sensitivities, we have to somehow penetrate the message of Krishna into their hearts. The Sashila Prabhupada did that by uh, explaining the bliss of Vaikuntha in the language of the hippies. It's like an ocean of LSD. 
the point is not just to get it right the point is to get it across similarly to bring auspiciousness in people's lives we have to pray to krishna and to prabhupada that we too can penetrate in their hearts in the hearts of people who are we can assume agitated there may not be so much physical distress but there is an enormous psychological distress even if people appear peaceful below the surface scrap and they are distressed because the three primary forces desire for the things which are out there which are not in our control the fear that the things which have got in also go away and the anger when they eventually go away these three are bound to agitate the mind and all these three arise from our disconnection with krishna ultimately our desire to be krishna so let the envy be pacified let everyone become peaceful that is the prayer of a devotee and there is a in this prayer to more that devotees try to inspire each other and inspire those who are not devotees to try to use their freedom judiciously for their and others well being thank you very much are there any questions or comments yes please Um, this is a beautiful point about just being sensitive to others, and I've noticed myself, and I've seen it happen with others too. Sometimes, in the name of protecting myself, I may exhibit insensitivity towards others. So, is, is there? And I'm being a little vague because. Is there a way that we can protect ourselves and still be sensitive to the feelings and emotions and needs of others? Yeah. So sometimes in protecting ourselves, we become sensitive to others. So how can we both protect ourselves and be sensitive to others also? Generally, Bhagavad Gita says that uh, something like aggressive intellectualism. is covered atheism or covered disbelief i said i won't it's not the exact phrasing like that but that is the theme that when we are very aggressive i'm right and you are wrong that is actually because we are ourselves insecure whether i am right and if i can prove that i am right to you if i can convert you to my path then i feel vindicated and if you are doing something different Then that becomes a threat to my faith. You know, if you are doing something right, and if that is right, that means what I am doing is wrong. Maybe I should not be doing this. So, to the extent our faith is insecure, to that extent our aggressiveness in interpersonal dealings is just a covered way to seek security. But if we understand that actually there are different people at different levels. and everybody is a different stage in their spiritual evolution and what is right for me now may not be right for this person at this place krishna also talks about there is in the vedic scripture there are so many different ways in which people can grow spiritually and krishna says don't disturb the mind of of the attachment hidam janaye agyanam karma sambhina joshaye sarva karmani vidman yukta samaj krishna says don't disturb the minds Of those who are attached, even if they are wrong, even if you are right, so and encourage them to engage themselves in a spiritual direction wherever they are. So basically, Krishna acknowledges that there are different people at different levels, and not everybody will take a significant leap forward in their spiritual life. If they can't take a leap, we don't have to kick them down. Just simply take one step forward, but a baby step will also. be moving forward be moving forward just like that so basically if we become more secure in our own faith that happens by our own serious practice by our own systematic scriptural study by our own strong devotional connections then we don't have that uh, that insecurity within us pushing us to prove to the other person that i am right and you are wrong or that you have to follow me Can understand that we can understand that Krishna has a different plan for different people, 
and Krishna has a plan for everyone. Actually. So if I am a part of Krishna's plan for this person, then Krishna will use me, Krishna will give me the right words, and Krishna will give this person the right receptivity by which my words will be received. But if Krishna has a plan that maybe not through me, through somebody else, this person is going to uh, become spiritually elevated, and that's fine. I will do my part by sharing Krishna's message with him and with this person and as appealing the way as possible. So if we can see there is this, there is the beautiful prayer of Bhaktivinoda Thakur where he says that if I go to a, a place of worship of somebody practicing another religion, this is Chaitanya Shikshamrita, a worshipping God is in a way different from what I know. And how, what should be my mood? He says that uh, let, I should be be there in a mood of reverence, appreciating how merciful God is that He has manifested here in a form that is different from what I know. So, although I can't, I can't appreciate whatever they are doing, what the exact manifestation, the exact practices, still I can appreciate the compassion of the Lord that He has reached out to His people in this manifestation. And therefore, my devotion to the Lord in the manifestation that I know is increasing. Thinking how compassionate the Lord is. So this way, we can, if we are, if we become secure in our faith, and we understand that different people may be doing differently in different, at different times, then we don't have to become aggressive. We don't have to become insensitive to them. So sometimes, if we want to protect ourselves, in general, education is given initially in terms of black and white. This is right, this is wrong. Moral categories are drawn very clearly. But then afterwards, as we, as we could say, morality intersects with reality. Then we understand that moral categories are not so rigid, they're porous. This might, I thought this was wrong and this was right. But then in real life, this, is in, lying is bad. But if somebody is in a situation where you know, they will be killed if they don't lie, or if we don't speak a lie, somebody else will be killed, then you can't speak a lie. That way. So this is just an example. My point is that initially education is given in black and white, but then we learn to see shades of grey. So initially people were told, students were told, three minus five is not possible. But they wrote three minus five is possible. So sometimes initially when we get our uh, spiritual education, the moral boundaries are drawn very rigidly. And that tends to make us very judgmental and sensitive. And that may work for our protection initially. But we live in an age where any kind of judgmentality is very much uh, uh, looked, frowned at. So that's why we also have to recognize that there are many shades of grey in between. And that's why we don't have to become judgmental. So by both recognizing that Krishna has many different ways of getting people to him and recognizing that between black and white there are many shades of grey. We can do what is best for us without necessarily needing to uh, impose that on others or to judge others based on what we are doing or based on what they are not doing. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. I'll repeat the question. No, you can. Yeah. Seems like in order to able to people's qualities in a way that is compromising with their emotions and to support them, to pacify them, to let them pass along, to have some sort of like an ambassador that can be guidance as much as it is that it's just not possible. Yeah, that's true. Uh, do if in order to be sense to speak in a way that can appeal to people given their emotional state, we have to have some mastery over our own emotions. Yes, <clears throat> I wouldn't say mastery. It is just that we need to be able to manage our emotions because emotions are a part of who we are, and we can't conquer emotions. Bhakti ultimately is emotion, and we want bhakti to be our master. It's like Krishna is our master. We want, to, we want to, Radharani is the representative of Bhakti. So we don't master our emotions, but we learn to channel our emotions. So 
our emotions are also meant to help us in serving krishna and so in that sense having intense concern for somebody that is that is we could say a uh, a precondition compassion is required when we are trying to connect with people but at the same time we have to evaluate whether my emotions are helping me to do this work or they help to do this service or they are coming in the way of doing the service if a doctor the surgeon has no emotions they may become very mechanical in treating patients but if a surgeon say is treating their own child at that time they may become too emotional you may told you you don't take the surgery let somebody else do it so at one level uh, the emotion in terms of concern or compassion has to be there but emotion in terms of excessive investment or the concentration of emotion in a particular thing in an excessive degree that is undesirable so we we have to have some amount we have to have some capacity to observe our emotions and channel them in a way that uh, helps people to come closer to krishna people do need to feel that they are concerned about him if they feel, if they feel that we are speaking about krishna it is just a uh, is like a academic professor speaking some abstract subject then this if, it's if they feel it's a paid job where we are no concern for the subject or the audience then they will not be uplifted but at the same time if our emotion makes us insistent or domineering there is a problem so sattva guna the mode of goodness is where there is the check regulation of emotions is the answer your question yeah oh not at all because i Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, is is that being emotional is not bad? Yeah, emotional is. See, some of us are said are more rational. Some of us are more emotional, and that is just the way we are. We may try to balance it, but prominently, some of us will be more rational. Some of us will be more emotional. and we can't change that defining nature that we have but if we find that it too rational then we may have to bring a little bit emotion into our ourselves also if we are too emotional then we need to bring a little bit rationality into our ourselves also so that we said that sculptors can change the shape of the stone but not the structure of the stone not what the stone is made of they can't make a marble into granite so similarly we could say that by our past karma itself we are we, we are structured as we in a particular way some of us will be structured to be more emotional some of us will be structured to be more rational so that core defining nature can't be changed like in general it is said that uh, females tend to be more emotional males tend to be more rational of course again there are boundaries that for us but this is just the way we are so but if we understand okay i am too emotional and the structure can be structural can't be changed but it can be shaped a little bit so then if i tend to be emotional then I, maybe i can decide that i need to have some other friend who is a little bit more rational and before taking any major decisions in my life i consider that if i tend to be more rational then i need to also think with the heart not just with the head so i need to ask somebody am i being sensitive enough over here am i hearing and understanding the other person's emotions so we all need to we all need to create a way in which we can balance our our whatever nature we have is that a question Supporting, assisting, and encouraging, and 
Okay. So is the responsibility of the community also to support emotional maturity? Uh, yes. There is the individual who has to act in a particular way, and the community as well has to support that kind of action. At the same time, the community is ultimately made of individuals. And the change has to begin with an individual. Throughout history, if you see in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, the changes have not happened from the top down, it is from the bottom up. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Gaudiya Vaishnavism had become very ritualistic and corrupted. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was an outsider. He was born in the Shakta family and then he got introduced to Krishna Bhakti. And then he, uh, he took Gaudiya Vaishnavism and then it was he who radically, dramatically reformed and represented Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Srila Prabhupada was to a large extent an outsider in the Gaudiya movement. After the Gaudiya, Gaudiya movement splintered due to infighting of Bhaktivinoda Sudhakur Dipakachar, it was Prabhupada who rejuvenated it. So in general, changes in a community, we could say about community of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, the community of the followers of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, these changes to expect that they should happen from top down. If it happens, well and good. But if you keep waiting for that, we will just be waiting for a long time. So we start doing what we can. And gradually, people will see what that it is. Okay, I'm being emotionally mature. And others see that. Others can also take the example. We can talk with others and we can talk with the community leaders also. And we can, we can say that I can assist in whatever way in doing this. But we can't, mm -hmm. we can't blame the community to be emotionally mature and <clears throat> continue being the way we are because that's the way everyone is. If we have a need for emotional mature readings, then it is for us to fulfill that need. And I try to be emotionally mature and I try to find within the community or the other now with social media and everything, we connect with people all over the world. We find other people in different places who are emotionally mature and get our need fulfilled. See, one, one major difference, which I may speak in later classes, between say childhood and adulthood is that the child thinks that it is the world's responsibility to fulfill my needs. The child starts crying and think that, oh, everybody has to come and pacify me and feed me and care for me. But if an adult starts crying, okay, they may cry and somebody may come, nobody may come also. To become an adult means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill my needs. It doesn't mean that no one will care for me. There will be people who will care for me, but it is for me to connect with them. This is why I was at one place, there was one, one devotee, not that she was becoming a devotee. And she said, she would sometimes come for program, not come for programs. So I was, I was staying at their house. And she, she told me that, you know, last time I fell sick, and I thought devotees will come and give me prasad, and they will give me mahaprasad, and garland. She says, nobody came to me at all. I told her, did you tell anyone that you were sick? She said, no. I thought you should know. How will they know? <laughs> devotees will be there to support, but devotees are not the super soul. So if I have a need, I have to find out how I can fulfill this need. And I have, it's not that anybody and everybody will fulfill my need. But there will be people who will be ready to do that, if I have connected with them. But recognizing that, basically, if we are driven too much by expectation, the community should change, then I will change. Then change will never happen. So our focus should be not on expectation, but on contribution. What can I do? How can I contribute to bring about this change? And then if we do that, then we will be empowered by Krishna to bring up a positive change, not just in our lives, but in the community at large. Okay. Yeah. Last question. Or you also have one. Let me know. Yeah, definitely. If we have the ability and the bandwidth through that, we should do that. Thank you. 
generally if we give suggestions if you are ready to implement them then we will be given the facility to do that but if we give suggestions and do nothing after that then it's not saying so positively yes sir. last question Balance, yeah, I agree. Sometimes you make people feel good, but unless they get the philosophical knowledge, they will not be able to stay. Yes, I agree, fully agree. Uh, in a future session, but tomorrow's session, I'll be talking about the example of the surgeon. The surgeon has said those words I meant to cut, and how does this apply in the whole feel good uh, analysis? But uh, that, that suffice to say here two points that if we present Krishna consciousness as simply feel good, then we are misrepresenting Krishna consciousness because there is purification required. A purification requires doing things which may not make us feel good, which we may struggle with. So Krishna consciousness is a whole package in which some things make us feel good, some things we may feel nothing about. Okay, I don't do it, I do it. Some things we just don't feel like doing it at all. So we're not saying that the whole of Krishna consciousness, whatever feels good, you just do that and don't do anything else. But what we're saying is that we don't have to present that aspect of Krishna consciousness, which is a challenge to people right in the beginning, which makes them feel bad, which makes them feel, it's too difficult, I can't do it, it's too demanding. These people are so judgmental. We have to have some moral categorization also. But we can't impose that right in the beginning. It's just like say if a new iPhone comes up, iPhone 10 or 11 or whatever, then uh, if they if Apple is going to promote an iPhone, this is the first they're going to say, this is one thousand dollars. Now first they say this feature, this feature, this feature, this feature, this new feature, this camera is like this, this is like this, this is like this. And at the end, the package is not complete without the price. So the price is there. But the price is not what the first thing they tell. They tell the features. They show the product. They show the features of the product. And they tell the price. And by showing the features of the product, what are they doing? They see that people feel, oh, if I have this, it'll be so good. It make people feel good. So similarly, we, when we are presenting Krishna Bhakti, we have to tell the features of Krishna Bhakti, which people can connect. Which add value to people's life, which where they are, which make people feel I want to do this. And then we tell the price also. But sometimes we tell the price first. Okay, what do you Hare Krishna do? No meditating, no gambling, no intoxicating, no illness. And they'll say no Hare Krishna. It's to present the price right in the beginning is simply to alienate the people. Because there's they have to feel that I'm going to get something worth the price. That is the first point. Second point is that when we are presenting Krishna consciousness, we need to, even if people don't feel good about the message, we don't have to make people feel bad about themselves. Even if our message is unpalatable, if people feel like, you know, okay, I met a nice person. I don't agree with what they're saying, but I met a nice person. That itself will give you some account. So, if the, if sometimes we find out that this person is just not ready for Krishna Bhakti, then they just to attach to their opinions, and still we can in a cordial, uh, polite way end the interaction and move on. Well, I'm a nice person. What happens sometimes we open the door for Krishna Bhakti for people and we invite them to come in. If they don't come in, back, we slam the door in their face. 
you are an envious rascal and you are destined to go to hell. I am not saying that explicitly, <laughs> but sometimes we make the make the philosophical discussion into a personal confrontation, and then people not only they don't accept it, but they even dislike us. So some, we definitely have to confront people's philosophical misconceptions sometimes, but that doesn't have to become a personal confrontation. We present our points, and they're not ready to agree. Just end the interaction with a cordial note. Nice meeting you, and and it could, and then at least had a get sympathy that unknown uh, positive impression of a devotee which will get it later to Krishna. Okay. So thank you very much. Shla Prabhupad ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Sayam Chaimanandi.